sharing that video was a great shout out to Jesus, wasn't it? Uh, our God is amazing. He's so wonderful. His grace, his forgiveness, and his power is uh, unrivaled in the world around us. Hey, if you're new to River, I'm so glad you're here this morning and delighted that, uh, that God sent you our way or, or uh, however you found us, whether you drove by or online. Uh, we're just really thrilled that you're here to worship God today. And uh, as a church, our desire is really pretty simple. We just want to be kind of a uh, kind of a come-as-you-are church, but we are very intentional and focused about helping people take their next spiritual step in their journey because we know that along the way, as we, uh, all of us want changes in our life, that God really is the one who brings the biggest changes of all, and they come through knowing and following Jesus personally. That's where those changes come from, and so we're all about focusing on that. And this morning, in fact, we're going to talk about how do you overcome Guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. We're talking through the book of Daniel, and uh, we've hit chapter 9 this morning, and as the end of Daniel is all about prophecy kind of stuff, we're going to not miss the forest for the trees, if you will. We're not going to miss the big picture of what's going on by focusing on all the little stuff, but we're going to see in just a minute in Daniel chapter 9 that he was experiencing, Daniel was experiencing incredible shame and a sense of guilt over not only his wrongs, but of the people of Israel. And they were experiencing judgment and punishment and really a not a very fun life in the process. But we're going to see that God has done something to remove all of that. In our culture and our world around us, shame has changed definition slightly. Languages do that, right? Words change, meaning changes, connotations change. All languages of the world begin to shift and focus over time, that kind of thing. Shame is one of those words as well. Shame used to be primarily a noun. It used to be something that you feel or something that you know you have. It used to be just something that you, uh, that you speak of. But now it's really more of a verb. It's something that you do. You can shame someone else. And you... If you uh, pay all attention to popular, you know, social media or even in the news, you can hear about various things, you know, whether it's body shaming or baby shaming, and, and shame is something that you do to somebody else. So in uh, kind of days gone by, you would often hear people say, you know, don't judge me. So if they hurt somebody who had a different viewpoint from them or maybe had an opinion about something that they did that was different that they disagreed with, they would be like, you're judging me. You're you're saying something, you know, against me. And then we kind of went to dissing, you know, don't diss me. And now we're to the shaming. And, and with that, there was a subtle shift of that. Because in the old school days, if you said, hey, don't judge me, it's something that that person's doing, but you don't necessarily let it stick to you. Today, if somebody shames you, then it has shifted to not where they're not judging you, is that you are experiencing that that sense of shame that it's almost a victimization if you will so um, the reason sean why are you giving me as this discourse on etymology and you know language and everything again you are hardcore sean on sunday morning you know i'm just barely getting my coffee and going after you know a weekend off so hang with me a little bit shame is a huge issue for us personally it's a big issue in our culture and i, I wanted to, to be clear about what we're talking about this morning I'm not so much talking about how do you deal specifically when somebody shames you. You know, today if somebody shames you, actually the way you overcome it is you go and you shame them. It's kind of so odd to me that if somebody's done something to you, then you just kind of ratchet it up and you're like, shame on you, you know, for doing X, Y, or Z. And it's just so, so strange to me. But uh, I want us to talk about what it, how do we overcome the sense when we have done something wrong and appropriate or maybe a sense in our life, how do we overcome that, that guilt and that shame that can hang in our life? Um, and we're going to see that in the process, it'll probably help you deal with some of the other shaming stuff too that's going on out there. But read with me if you would first in Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. Daniel is, is kind of, we're, we're beginning to wind down the, the, the book as we walk down through this together, and he's... He is, uh, he is studying God's word because he has this overwhelming sense of conviction that we, you will see in a minute. That he and his family and his kinsmen and women have absolutely royally blown it. 
And because of it, they're in exile and they are suffering the consequences of that. And you will hear him speak of his shame and you'll hear the guilt that he talks about in this. So read with me starting in verse 1. The Bible says this in Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books... Talking about the Bible, books of the Bible, which is significant, by the way. The Old Testament was recognized as sacred and something that worth reading way back then. It didn't, it was not a modern invention. But he's perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Sean, I am lost already. What are you talking about? Here's the deal. Jeremiah studying in the book, I mean, uh, Daniel studying the book of Jeremiah, who was contemporary with Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, God revealed a da through, uh, through Jeremiah that there would be 70 years from the time that Babylon came and conquered Israel, that Israel and Jerusalem in particular would go through tremendous desolations and just awful kinds of things. But after 70 years, that would be removed, and then God would in turn Babylon punish Babylon for all of their sins and their atrocities. God is a just God. He deals with everyone rightly from where they are. He was willing to use people's sin to judge other people's sin, but in the end, he holds everyone absolutely accountable. So Daniel is saying, in his mind, he's saying, okay, I'm now in Babylon, and Jeremiah says it's going to last 70 years. How long, O oh Lord, is this going to last? But God... I'm seeing that we really have not learned from our mistakes. I'm watching with my eyes, and all of my fellow Jews are still doing the stuff today that they did then, and he's worried that it's going to continue on. You know, it's kind of like when you got detention for doing something wrong. If you keep doing that something wrong, you get detention again and again until you finally get expelled. Daniel's worried that they're going to get detention all over again. It's going to be another 70 years and another 70 years. So he's reaching out to God, saying, God, would you help me? Have you ever been in a spot in your life where you just kind of looked up and said, wait a minute, something's wrong. Life is really hard. What, what is going on? And have you ever looked around and had this inkling that, I think I've really messed up some things here. I think I've messed this relationship up. I think I, think I have really blown it. See, Daniel's in that experience right now. He knows that his life and the life of his people are not a life of abundance that God had designed originally for them. And in that moment, he realized that it was his fault, and he realized it was the people's fault around him, and he's trying to figure out what to do with it. So read with me the rest of what he does. Look in verse 3. Here's what he does. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, I, we won't read the whole thing, but we're going to read quite a bit of it. I want you to notice 20 different times Daniel says, God, I and my people have sinned. We rebelled, we disobeyed you, we didn't listen to what you told us to do, we've transgressed, we've done wrong. 20 times. Listen to the guilt that he's feeling here. He says this. He says in verse 4, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him, who keeps his commandments. God, you haven't made any mistakes. You have owned and honored your word. You have kept the agreement with us. You've not done anything wrong. He says to you, the great and awesome God, in verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong, and acted wickedly, and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. You're righteous. But to us, open shame, as at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, to those who are near, and those who are far away, and in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that you have 
that they have committed against you. To us, O oh Lord, belongs open shame. It says it again. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us. Here's the bottom line. Because we have sinned against now. Pray with me, would you? Father, I thank you for the truth and the testimony of Daniel. Lord, these are things that we all deal with when we have done wrong towards you and even toward others. We feel the guilt and the shame. And Father, Daniel sets before us what we should do, how we should approach it, because we, just like Daniel, we have all done wrong against you. But Lord, you're a God of mercy. You're a God of love. You're a God of righteousness. You're a God who keeps covenant, who keeps the agreement with what you said you would do, you will do. And Lord, I'm grateful that you sent Jesus, as we'll see in just a minute, to die to pay for our sin so that all of our shame and guilt might be removed. Lord, help us to see your grace and your glory, your power in our today, your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to live in the light of it, to endure the season of shame and guilt, but to move past them as we turn to you for forgiveness and relief. Lord, help us to walk in freedom, I pray, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's awful easy to live your life with overwhelming, crushing guilt, a sense of shame as you walk through of things gone by, things that you've done in days past that you can't seem to get past, things that just bump into you, maybe experiences that you've had. And I would say as I look around at our world today, it's increasingly more and more difficult to how do you get how do you deal with all of that? And the popular social media and culture all around us is wrestling with it. I, therapists are wrestling with it, as I've shared in many different ways. We shouldn't be surprised at, at, at the things that we're seeing. But I want us to recognize this morning that when you take God out of the picture, when you take God's Word out of the picture, you're, it's like you're trying to win a game with only half the deck of cards. You've got some of the things, but you don't have all of the things. You don't ever get all of the cards to be able to deal with it. It's popular in our world today, to, you know, a sense of positivity. Let's just be very positive. And we should maintain a lot of encouragement and positive outlook and all of that. But we have all the way have got to deal with some of these other things like anxiety and fear and shame and guilt and all of that. And it's popular even among therapists to say, well, you need to just immediately get rid of that and you need to stay in this other world. I want us to realize this morning that those emotions, negative emotions, if we would say, I think they get a little bit of a bad rap. They, are, they don't feel good, and certainly run amok and given full authority over time in our life, they will mess you up. But we're going to see that God has a specific purpose for them. And if you ignore them completely, you will absolutely make some major mistakes and bad judgments in your life. God wants to remove the shame and the guilt out of our life, but he's the one who needs to do it, and we shouldn't just duck out of it. So put yourself in Daniel's shoes. Daniel is experiencing, a, he's in a mess, he's in a fix. He is experiencing punishment and judgment. God has allowed the enemy of Israel to come and conquer and vanquish them, and People were scattered to all parts of the world, and many were continuously being uh, abducted, if you will, and sent into Babylon. And Daniel knew the whole reason was because he and his friends and all of his ancestors had ignored and neglected God's word. They had done life their own way. They had said, I don't care what God says is right and wrong. I'm going to ignore that, and we're going to do what we want to do. And God said, fine. 
Keep, keep in mind, God told them that, hey, if you enter into a relationship with me, here's the deal. you got to obey me. You stop obeying me, I'm going to allow your enemy to come, and, and you will absolutely experience desolation in your life and in your nation and in your city and beyond all of that. And so Daniel looked for answers, and he turned to God's word, and God gave him some answers in his word. And he's praying and he's trying to understand what this 70 weeks thing is. The prophecy nerds in the room will be like, oh, this is all the good stuff that we talk about all the end times and the tribulation and all that. And all of that's real. But I want us to recognize, really what's going on here is a man who's trying to deal with his sin and the sin of the people. And trying to understand how long he's got to endure the judgment. The, the convicting hand of God upon him. First thing I want us to recognize this morning is, is that anxiety or uh, guilt and shame are not necessarily bad. They're not all bad. Guilt and shame are not, not all bad. When you do something wrong, I hope you feel guilty for a while. I hope there's a little bit of shame in there for a while. You see, guilt and shame are part of that moral compass that God has put in our heart. The Bible tells us that God has put eternity in our hearts. It gives us a sense of wanting something beyond just this life, a sense of something that wants to be eternal. It gives us an awareness that there's a bigger world around us. It sets us apart as people from all of the natural order around us. And part of it is that sense of guilt and shame when we've done wrong. See, the world around us will want to say, just completely ignore it, you need to put it aside. But Daniel did the opposite. He ran toward it, he acknowledged it, and he said, we are living in shame. God, we have done wrong. 20 times, he says, we are guilty. We've done all of this stuff that's wrong, and we are suffering. The shame is a result of this. God is, you are punishing us. Guilt and shame is not completely bad. It's bad when you allow somebody else's standards to tell you somebody's standards other than God's. Say, think about it this way. The only time you feel guilt and shame is when a standard is broken. It's the only time. If you do everything right, life's good. So here's the deal. In the world in which we live, there are multiple standards. There's your own standard. There's your standard maybe of your family or that which you were brought up with. There is uh, the standard of the popular world around you. And if you're on social media, you absolutely know that standard is there. Uh, I, tr I think I've said this before, but I truly feel for parents today. They are, every parent has always felt the burden and the pressure to be the best perfect parent on the planet. Because you just deep down know if you make a mistake, it's going to be totally on you and your kid's going to be scarred for life and can't do anything worth anything. That's, we battle that as parents. Social media has taken that to infinite measures because now you just go on and you have to find the perfect everything, the perfect high chair that's great, and the perfect baby food, the perfect way to do nap time, the perfect this, the perfect that, and all these parents are creating all these wonderful images online, and it creates a sense of shame for mom and dad who, because nobody on the planet can live up to that kind of stuff. Uh, ridiculous, the kind of pressure that's put on there. What's happening? There's a standard being set. And we feel the shame and the guilt when we don't live by it. I was a bad parent today. I gave my kid a Dunkin' Donut. Hey, it's not going to go. Probably like it. You might ask for more, but it's not the end of the world. It's okay if your kid went to bed an hour later than you really wanted to. Now, it might be another thing if you're giving Dunkin' Donuts every day, and you know, you, you get the picture. Many of us walk around trying to hit a standard that God didn't put in place. First thing I want you to realize is the first step of dealing with guilt and shame is make sure you've got the right kind of guilt and shame. Don't feel guilty and shamed about stuff that doesn't matter. Don't feel guilty and shame about people's other standards. Like the standard that really ought to matter to you is God's. Ignore all the other stuff. If I listen to the, the popular world around me, I would walk around with such shame all day, it would be horrible. I don't even look right. And that's not even fully my fault. I mean, I'm 50 years old. 
I know I look older than I am. I because I battle skin cancer. I've had surgeries here and here and here and here. I'm banking on a whole nose job when I'm done. You know, it'll just be awesome. I've got a big cyst that's growing here. Um, my teeth aren't straight; they're crooked. Um, you know, I'm a, a white, middle-class, educated man, so half the world's problems are my fault, according to the world around me. I, I, you know, I just gotta quit it and just walk around in life with paper bag over my head. You know, my body's not perfect. Um, you know, I've got a little weight on me in some places, and other places I just don't have any muscle at all, which is not cool for a guy. But so I have two options. I can either ignore that standard. And live life free and say, you know what? God's opinion of me matters way more than all of that. And my wife's opinion matters a whole lot more than that. Or I can try to achieve a standard that's popular in the world around me and walk around with guilt and shame that is not at all realistic. So the first step in getting over guilt and shame is make sure you feel guilty and shameful for the things you ought to. Well, Sean, what things should we feel guilty and shameful for? I'm so glad you guys asked me that question. <laughs> the things you ought to feel guilty and shameful for are the things that God tells you not to do. And when you do them, I hope you feel guilty for them. Because they're there to keep you safe. They're there to tell you, this is bad. Think about it this way. If you're out hiking in Adirondacks and a bear comes running down the trail, and there, you look behind and nobody's behind you, you know what's coming for you. I hope you have fear in that moment. That's a good thing, is it is motivating you to do something about it. I put my family, uh, my sons and I, and some of you guys helped me put a roof on my house. When you're 20 feet up in the air, I hope there's a little bit of fear, like I better hold on and not fall off. It's healthy to have that. If you've got a test coming the next day, and you've not studied, I hope you get a little bit of anxiety somewhere more than a day or two out, because it will motivate you to... Hey, this big thing's coming up. I need to deal with it. I hope when you get married, there's a little bit of anxiety along the way. Not paralyzing, but to say, this is a big deal. If you just act like it's something as simple or, you know, no big deal, then I'm like, what is wrong with you? You know, this is, you're not making a loaf of bread here. You're getting married. This is a big deal. So when we do wrong, it is a part of that compass in us that God has told us, don't do that. It's harmful to people. It's destructive. It's deadly. It ought to put a check in our heart and on our soul. Now, it becomes bad whenever you can't either find freedom from guilt and shame. Chronic guilt and shame is deadly. God doesn't want us living our entire life without guilt and shame. But we'll see in a minute, popular ways of getting rid of it, like meditation or whatever, won't cut it. Only the God in heaven can truly remove guilt and shame out of your heart and out of your soul. He's the only one that can take when you and I have really blown it, and we know we've blown it despite whatever any therapist or anybody else tells us, and we know it. He's the only one that can truly remove that out of us. So don't be afraid of guilt and shame. But make sure you have it in the right quantities, small doses, alright? This is like those I'm not a nutritionist. My daughter's a dietitian. She knows all this. This is like those little trace minerals and things that you're supposed to get. You know, you're not supposed to have a bowl full of manganese every, you know, just chowing down. You need like iron and stuff, but you don't need ridiculous amounts. Guilt and shame, a little bit, it goes a long way. So embrace it, deal with it, because it will force you to deal with something that needs to be dealt with, and that's your actions, your attitudes, behavior. Don't run away from it. Now, here's the thing. Some of you were brought up in homes that either used guilt and shame as a motivating factor. Like your parents held that over your head or your, whoever was there. That's toxic. That's not healthy. So you're going to have to work hard to say, you know what? That's the wrong, bad guilt and shame. So reject all of that and learn to take some steps along the way to embrace what God is convicting you of and putting in your heart and soul. It, 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 get rid of all of that other in the past. And make sure that you don't use that as a manipulative factor with your own kids. I might, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about that before I hit the end. Second thing I want you to notice, not all guilt and shame is bad. In small doses, 
for the right standard that God says, don't do this, and we do it. Or when we've harmed and we know it, God is trying to put something in our hearts to deal with it. Why? Because he just wants us to feel bad? No. Because he wants us to make us deal with right and wrong and righteousness so that he can bring us to himself and so that he can remove it because he truly wants to heal us. That's what the guilt and shame is, is all about. Second thing I want you to recognize. Now, is a good, good in small dosage, but the first thing that we need to do uh, in dealing with good guilt and shame is we need to take responsibility. We have to take responsibility. Have you noticed in the world around us, increasingly it's popular to just be the victim. It's increasingly popular to blame all of our personal issues on somebody else or something else, someone else, or the environment around us. It's now cool to be a victim. And there's all kinds of victims out there. You will not get rid of your shame and your guilt unless you take responsibility for your actions, for what you've done. This is subtle here, but Daniel is taking responsibility. That's very clear. But he's going to the one whom he has offended, to God. And he's saying, I blew it. You and I need to take the two words, or the one word, two letters, if, out of our apologies. I've seen this on TV. I've seen others do this. Look, if I offended you, I'm sorry. If I hurt you, that is just weak as water. That is, there's no responsibility in that. You and I need to step up and say, I blew it. I did it wrong. I hurt you. I did something that was very wrong towards you. We don't see Daniel turning to God. Well, if we offended you, God, if we broke any of your laws, God, if we ignored your word, if we didn't quite pay attention in every area, forgive us. He said, no, we've done all of this. You and I, to remove the guilt and shame, we should go to the person that we've done wrong to if, it's, if they're aware of it, now if they're not aware of it, you need to go straight to God. If you start apologizing to things toward people that are absolutely clueless, like you had a bad thought about them, they will think you're weird and you will make even bigger problems. Like if they're not aware, just confess it to God and get it straight, all right? But if, if you punched them in the nose, then go back the next day and say, I really shouldn't have punched you in the nose. Then you might want to duck because they're probably going to swing at you, but... You know, deal with it up front that way. But go to the person. And know that God never forgets the stuff that we do wrong, even years later. A number of years ago, I've shared this, but it's been a long time, so many of you, if not most of you, have heard it. But a, a, a few, quite a few years ago, my sister was visiting. She was up in our home. I remember we were sitting on the dining room table. A bunch of my kids were there. And she, you know how siblings do when you get older. Remember when mom and daddy start playing that game? Well, she brought something up that I had told totally forgotten about. Do you remember when you had the car, my mom and dad's car, nice blue Toyota Celica car, and uh, you remember you were at work and it got hit? And I, yeah, I'm thinking, no. Oh, I do remember now. And what I remembered was, oh no, that's really not what happened. What the story that I told it was not the truth, was that I had come out from work. This was my senior year of high school. I was trying to make money for college. I worked at Kmart, and I was part of the closing store shift. I was responsible for the cosmetics, which was a mistake. The toy aisle, you know, which was okay, and that drove me crazy because every parent in the world let their kids play with everything. It was my job to put it all back where it was supposed to be. But we closed the store, and we drove out that night, and we were right across from the Kmart was our, our, their town's uh, movie theater. It just let out, so it, I mean, it was just backed up traffic. And I wasn't paying attention. Oh, the story I told was is that, oh, I came out from work, and somebody hit the car. Sorry, Mom and Dad. And they believed me. It was a bold-faced lie. The real story was I, um, I was following bumper to bumper, and I didn't pay attention. I was looking away, and I... I rear-ended uh, the car in front of me. Happened to be my supervisor, which I don't ever recommend, you know, <laughs> you run into your supervisor's car. And I went home and I told that absolute bold-faced lie. Why? Because I didn't want to get in trouble as any good teenager did. 
I compartmentalized that apparently in my life and it totally erased it from my memory. Like literally when my sister brought it up, I thought, what are you talking about? Why? Because I didn't want to feel guilt. That was my way of dealing with the guilt and the shame. Just ignore it, move on. That's the way most of what the world does and they will tell you to do. But you know what God did? God said, you're not getting away with this, Sean. Here I was, a man in my 40s. And this lie coming back, now at my dining room table, in front of my wife and my kids, and I'm lying all over again. My sister, oh, you remember that story? I hit him like, oh, yeah. And I finally like, and after that, you know, you're like deer in the headlights. Like, what do I do? I just, I'm just not remembering this thing. I felt guilty and ridiculously shameful as a grown man for that because it wasn't just something I did as a teenager. It now was something renewed in my life as an adult. So what did I do? I went and I called my dad. Dad, do you remember that story? Oh yeah, I remember that son. I was a complete lie, Dad. You know how humbling it is to apologize to your parent 30 years later or whatever the time frame was? Sean, isn't there a statute of limitations? Not with God. It might be with New York State and U.S. law, but not with God. None of the seven-year, ten-year stuff. I had to then call my sister, sis, I lied. I had to go to my wife, I lied. My kids, I lied. That's a whole lot of humble by. I was embarrassed, shamed, and guilty. But if you don't take responsibility, you don't ever get out from under it. And I would have continued it, and all the while, God would have known it, and he would not have let me get away with it. It would have kept coming back again and again and again until I did what I needed to do to take that responsibility. To deal with guilt and shame, you've got to take responsibility and go to the person. And then after the person, or before even, you got to go to God. I had to go to God and say, God, I, I lied. I was wrong. God's like, yeah, I know. Why did God take so long to really convict you of it? I don't know. Probably because I was so thick-headed that I probably wouldn't have heard. I probably wouldn't have dealt with it. And he probably had to tenderize my heart a little bit in that area. By the way, when you ignore guilt and shame over time, it will mess you up. It will either lead you as therapist or right. It can lead you to chemical dependency and all kinds of stuff, trying to mask that negative feelings. They don't understand. We really are morally responsible for who we are. And if you block it off and you just don't do that, but you just ignore it, it, part of your heart hardens. And you get harder and harder and harder, and you feel less guilty over time. And meanwhile, your sin gets deeper and deeper and deeper. That's why sexual sins tend to spiral. They tend to start small, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until you're in a really deep, dark hole. That's how serial killers end up being born. They can start small and go... You know, it's bigger. Our sins actually do that too. So we have to say, take responsibility and say, it's all my fault, God. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Completely. Take responsibility. Third thing. Even when you take responsibility, God's the only one who really truly can remove your guilt and your shame. You can't do it. It's a rock too big for you to lift. It's an internal thing in your soul that God has to lift from you. Can time fade? Sure. Can you compartmentalize it? Sure. Some things, not well. There's some things in your life that just tend to hang as a cloud over your head. And they can cause bitterness and all kinds of weirdness that comes out of your pores in different ways. I like sweat, you know, when people begin smelling stuff around you. Like, why are you just whatever? Dang. Because you, you're walking around with shame of stuff that you've done, and you've got this heavy burden in your life that you've not been able to get free from. I just want to say, every one of us in this room have done multiple things that God looks at and thinks are an absolute atrocity, that are offensive to Him. We've all done multiple things that are egregious towards other people, stuff that we would all be embarrassed about, it's a normal part of life. It's wrong, it's inexcusable, but it's real. And God, in His great grace and mercy, when we saw in the video, wants to, to deal with that stuff. He wants to remove it. He wants to take it away out of our life. 
Notice the verses, read with me in verse 24, and I just realized I skipped the verses for that whole last point of take responsibility, but they're in there. He prayed, he confessed to God, he entreated to God, all kinds of good stuff in there. But read, read these verses that, that point to what God has done. This is really cool. This is where if you're a prophecy nerd, you actually miss the really cool stuff. The really cool stuff isn't in here, what's going on with the 70 weeks and how this is all playing out. The really cool stuff is what God has done to remove our guilt and shame. Read with me. 70 weeks, which is actually 70 years. For Jew, Jewish people talked about weeks as days, week of days. They talk about weeks of years, like every seven years was a year of jubilee. And Jeremiah makes it clear, it's 70 years, not just weeks. So this is actually 70 sevens is what the Hebrew literally says. 70 weeks or 70 sevens are decreed about your people and your whole city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin. Here's the cool stuff that God is doing. But an end of sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. <laughs> I didn't read the passage before this, but Daniel was praying and fasting and entreating the grace of God, and he was taking responsibility in his life. And while he's there, God sends him an angel Gabriel. And he was, Daniel was trying to understand these 70 years. He was so scared to death that his people were still missing the boat. And that God was just going to extend this. And that God was done with them. That there was no hope. And he didn't understand exactly what was happening. And so while he's praying, God sends a messenger to him, an angel. And he says, Daniel, you are most loved. It's awesome that God loves us. And he reveals to him, he says, your prayer has been heard. And here's what God is doing about it. There's 70 sevens. This time is going to be passings, which is actually seven years is one week. So like 500 years, 490 specific if you do the math. And here's what God is going to do. He's going to finish the transgression. He's going to stop it. He's going to cut off the sins. He's going to put an end to the sin of your people. Daniel just confessed. He says, God, we're all at fault. We're all wrong. We're in a mess. And what we're in, we're stuck. We don't know how to get out of it. We know that it's what we've done. And God's telling him, I know. I'm going to remove the guilt from you. I'm going to put down and put away all of that sin. Because when all of that sin and guilt is removed, then I can bless you and put you in a much better place. You see, and then he's going, to, he's going to do it by atoning for our iniquity. He explains a little bit further what that means when he tells us that there is going to be a, a, an anointed one. Look in verse 25. Know therefore and understand from the going out of the word to restore Bill Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one. That's the word Messiah. That's the word in the New Testament, Christ. There is a Christ coming, a prince. There shall be seven weeks. In verse 26, and after the 70, 62 weeks, an anointed one, there's that word again, the Messiah, the Christ, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. That's talking about Jesus' crucifixion. There's a prediction that God is saying, Daniel, I know you all messed up. There's a time coming. There's a finite set of time that's coming. There's a Messiah who's going to come, and he is going to be cut off. He is going to be crucified as the ultimate picture of what we're, we now in the New Testament can look back and see. Who's going to be the one who atones, that overcomes our sins, that, that takes the shame, takes the penalty, takes the guilt off of you, and he's going to put it on himself. He's going to make up for all of that. See, you and I do stuff in life that we know we can't make up for it. We know that. We know it internally. Nobody has to tell us. We just know it. We, we can't overcome it. Can't buy a box of flowers and candy to, to fix it. It's not going to work. But God in heaven is the one who's able to overcome all of the egregious and horrendous things that we've done. And that's what he did through Jesus on the cross. He did it to put an end to the sin in your life and my life. He did it to atone for it, to pay the penalty of punishment and guilt and shame so that he could then in turn bring in righteousness. 
to bring in, in verse 24, everlasting righteousness. Do I feel guilty anymore or shameful about hitting that car? Not in the least. Do I still see it as wrong? Absolutely. I still see the lies wrong? Absolutely. It's amazing how that multiplied. It went from one wrong to the next, even bigger, right? That's the way this all grows. I feel zero guilt and shame about any of that. Well, Sean, but you did all of that. I know. But Jesus paid for all of that. He took all of that guilt and shame. If he paid my bill, why am I trying to pay it again? If I go out to eat and I put down the bill and pay the dinner, why would you try to pay after we walk out? You're not going to go back to the restaurant and say, I know he already paid, but I really want to pay too. The, the restaurant owner would be like, you don't need to do that. And then they're like, well, okay, sure, I'll take your money. I mean, I guess they would. But God in heaven, it's not the way it works. So you and I, when we truly know Jesus, that stuff in your past, all you need to do is say, God, if you really are born again and you know Jesus is Lord of your life and it's still creeping up in your heart, you need to simply say, God, please forgive me. That was wrong. Do what he did. Pray and treat the God a favor. Maybe God's convicting hand is on your soul for a moment. Endure that. God is a loving God. Folks, he's a tough God. He's not afraid of a little bit of negativity. But say, God, thank you that Jesus died for me. And that as far as you're concerned, this is over. It's done. And you, you move on and you put it all behind you. I don't care how awful the thing is that you've done in your past. I don't care if you committed murder. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't care. God wants to remove all of that through Jesus. Now, you may need to take the, maybe you kill somebody, you may end up going to jail, going to prison for it. That, just because God saves us, forgives us, or removes guilt and shame in his eyes, we still have a responsibility in the laws of the world around us that you've got to deal with. But in God's eyes, he removes all of that. And he loves us for it. You see, the world and the noise around us will tell us that you and I should be ashamed of all kinds of things in our life. Most of it doesn't matter. Most of it God doesn't care about. He doesn't care what brand of baby food you give your kid. He doesn't care whether you bottle feed or nurse your kid. He doesn't care what your bedtimes are or what this or that is going on. He doesn't care. But he does care about your and my actions that are dishonoring to him and to others, that break his law, that break his standard of loving him and loving others, and he absolutely will hold us accountable. And we will experience moments of that shame and that guilt. Why? Because he loves us. He wants to deal with it. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible tells us that we should not reject that chastening, literally scourging hand of God in our life because it's for a moment and it's a sign that we are His kids. I don't ever remember being disciplined, hardly ever disciplined by anyone other than my parents. I remember a couple of teachers had to discipline me and frankly I deserve most of it. Some of it I didn't. Um, People who were strangers didn't just come up to me to try to tell me stuff to do and discipline me if they saw wrong behavior. Why? I wasn't their kid. I wasn't under their jurisdiction. When God disciplines you and me and we feel that guilt and that shame, take it as a sign that he loves you. For some of you, if you weren't disciplined growing up, that may feel weird. It may feel like God doesn't love me. Actually, it's the opposite. You've got a flawed compass in your mind of what this all looks like. You need to realize that God is trying to tell you right from wrong and teach you and train you. And his heavy hand will be on you for a season and you will feel that spiritually in your soul. Endure that. Accept it. And allow God to, to teach you. 
that confess that sin. And as you do, somewhere down the line, that's going to pass. And know that it's over with in the eyes of God. That's the way, that's why you and I as parents should not be afraid to discipline our kids. Give them a standard of right and wrong that matches their age. Don't yell and scream. Don't ever manipulate with, you know, shame and guilt. You know, don't eat that. You're going to be fat. Absolutely, that's manipulation with shame or whatever. Don't ever go anywhere down that direction. Make clear standards. Have clear consequences that are appropriate. We can talk more about it offline. You know, what those are. When your kid flops their big, fat, hairy toe across it, bring the consequences to bear. Don't threaten them again and again and again and again because they're never going to learn. You're just going to threaten them. Give them the consequences. But then you restore them and you love them. And they never think that once that you don't love them and you're teaching them that love is a full relationship here. Here's what happens when you don't do that. You're actually harming your kid more because... Your teeth, when you don't set standards and discipline your kid appropriately and love them and restore them in that process and make it over with, your kid then walks around with guilt and shame because inside they know they're guilty. And they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to overcome it. And you're predisposing them to all kinds of weird emotional garbage and baggage in their life. When they've blown it and they know that you know that they've blown it, Best thing you can do is bring the consequences and restoration. It pops up all the bubble and it's all helping good. It removes the, uh, the pus and the infection out of that relationship. And, and when we don't do that, we predispose them that the first time they run into a boss that tells them they didn't do a good job and they need to fix it, they crumble. Why? Because they don't know how to handle Anybody that told them no or that they didn't do a good job. And let's be honest, there's all kinds of times we don't do a good job. But you're teaching the mom and dad that, hey, this is an issue of me and my value as a person. This is an issue of me and my value and my position as family. This isn't a position anywhere in the world. You're teaching them how to handle all these things well and how not to be a snowflake in this crazy world. I can't prove it on the PhD or anything, but part of what's happening all around us is so many parents have not really set good discipline habits with, with kids. And they, they fall apart at the first time anybody says anything against them that they don't like or something different that they don't agree with and all of that. Instead, we ought to be setting that pattern in our homes. That all of that is a reflection of God's pattern toward us. So don't be afraid of it, Mom and Dad. Embrace it, but remember, a little bit goes a long way, and it needs to go away. It needs to dissipate and be gone. So our team is going to come up. I have no clue what God is talking to your heart about this morning, talking to you. Maybe it's something that you have not apologized to God for. Maybe you're sitting there and saying, but Sean, I'm saved. I thought I'm forgiven. Yeah, you are. But God still wants us to deal with specific things, and He's God. And He may bring some stuff up in your mind that you've not confessed. Confess that to Him. Get that straight with Him. Maybe you've wronged somebody else. I don't know. Maybe you need to go to them and deal with some of that. Or maybe as a parent, you need to think through what that looks like. Maybe you've just allowed the world to press in and tell you that you're supposed to look a certain way and do something else and your values wrapped up all of that. What you really truly are carrying is shame because you've not lived up to somebody's standard. Recognize that for what it is. That's just the enemy trying to put junk into your life and mess you up and it's all noise. Just say, God, would you help me and forgive me? I shouldn't even be listening to that. Help me to take my cue from you and what you say about me and ignore all of that. Whatever God is kind of stirring up in your heart this morning, I'm going to ask that you stand. And uh, I'm going to pray for you. Our team is going to lead us in a song, a response song, meant to help us to respond to what we've been talking about this morning. So pray with me, would you? Father in heaven, I'm so grateful that you taught us how to deal with shame and guilt. Daniel lived in open shame that was there for all to see and felt that crushing sense of guilt and shame. Lord, I'm blown away that your solution to it is to take all of that upon your son. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for his redemption. 
Thank you for that salvation. Lord, I pray for those this morning that have really never trusted Jesus and they've not walked into that world of freedom, of joy and acceptance with you. Father, I pray that you would convict them of the sin of righteousness and judgment to come that you said the Holy Spirit would do. I pray that they would embrace it, that conviction and that sense of guilt and shame. Lord, would they trust you for the solution to remove it from their soul by trusting Jesus as their Lord. Lord, I lift them to you in Jesus' name. Amen.